Thank you very much uh, for the uh, very kind introduction. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I was asked to talk about critical raw materials, and I like to call them potentially critical raw materials because, I mean, it's just a definition thing, but I think it's very important nonetheless. Um, just to give you a quick intro to who I am, if you don't know me already, I work at the, it's a very long term, German Mineral Resources Agency, short DERA, and it is part of our geological survey. And I think what's more important is that we are subordinate to uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. So we are tasked with two very specific things. One is the um, direct uh, consultancy to our government in all geo-relevant and critical raw materials related questions, and at the same time to our industry as a free service to them. And you can believe me if I say that the last six or seven months have been quite um, a challenge because of the things that are going on globally. So what are the global challenges that we're facing right now? I mean, we do have the war in Ukraine and the associated sanctions on Russia, mostly on the energy side, not so much on the metals side um, as of now. And associated with that, we've got very, very high energy material prices and costs, price volatility, which is always an issue for the industry. We've got a lot of issues with energy security and the transition in Europe, which will be accelerated by phasing out fossil fuels towards renewable energies. Um, we've got um, recession concerns, or we do have a recession in, in some countries. We have a skills shortage. Um, we do have a lot of um, issues that need to be solved, but we don't have the people to do that. Um, you still have the uh, zero COVID strategy in China. As a matter of fact, they have the highest um, infection rates since this whole thing started. China has a changing supplier role. I mean, we've all seen the uh, supply chain issues that we've had in the past. We've got geopolitical issues above anything. We've got logistic problems and supply bottlenecks. And this, in all, is a huge challenge for the whole industry globally. And then, of course, we've got climate change that's still happening too. So when you talk about raw materials for the energy transition, and I just picked a couple here, uh, which is uh, PV, so solar, wind turbines, so-called green hydrogen, and of course, e mobility. They all will need a lot of raw materials. I mean, talk about PV, it's glass, steel, concrete. Concrete is very, very CO2 intensive. One ton of uh, cement uh, produces two tons of CO2. Um, you've got aluminum, silicon, copper, plastics, and a lot of um, electronics. For wind turbines on and offshore, you've got concrete again, steel, stainless, um, high corrosion resistant alloys that need a lot of cobalt. Uh, copper, we need a lot of copper. Lead, polymers, fiberglass, things like that. And then green hydrogen, depending on the technology that you're using, if you use like a PEM cell, you need a lot of uh, nickel, um, titanium and graphite. But you will also need platinum group metals like platinum and above all, iridium. Iridium is gonna be the bottleneck for the uh, electrolysis of water for green hydrogen. And a lot of people don't even talk about that the raw material really for green hydrogen is what? It's very pure water. Where do you get the water from? We want to have green hydrogen in areas like Namibia. We just signed an MOU with uh, Namibia or in Chile. You, you do have a lot of renewable energies there potentially, but you don't have a lot of water there. So you need uh, seawater desalination, which needs a lot of energy. And of course you've got, um, in my belief, associated problems with um, the people that live there because you're in an area that is facing a huge water scarcity. And now we go there and tell them to produce green hydrogen for us in Europe by desalinating water that they don't have as drinking water. So I think there is something going on there that will be a problem in the near term future. And then of course, immobility, my, <laughs> my favorite topic that I'm working on for the past seven years we do need a lot of batteries for that, lithium ion based batteries for the next 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, even though we're going to solid state batteries, but they all need a lot of raw materials as an input. Um, regardless of the cathode material that we're choosing, whether it be in an LFP, NMC, NCA, 
They do need various amounts of nickel, cobalt, etc., but they all need lithium. They cannot work without lithium. So lithium is going to be the possible bottleneck in this whole battery space thing. Um, this is um, one of my favorite charts, which is um, out of our, what we call critical raw materials list. It reads fairly easy. The further you go to the right and the further you go to the, so the further you go to the upper right corner, the more potentially critical a material gets in terms of um, the, the concentration of the supplying industry, as well as uh, the governance of those countries. And the favorite example is always cobalt. We get about 80% of the cobalt supply globally comes out of the Congo. And this is not going to change. It will always be the Congo because our dear God had a very strange sense of humor when he put it there. Um, but what's more important is this right um, area that you see. You see a lot of ma materials that we just touched upon. So you've got cobalt, you've got the platinum group elements, you've got rare earth elements, um, you've got antimony, fluorine, vanadium, magnesium, all of the materials that we will need in huge quantities for the energy transition globally and especially here in Europe are either very concentrated in f a few countries or are located in countries with questionable governance. Many of these materials we do not have in Europe, but we desperately need them in order to get this transition going. This is the mining side. We do have the same charge for the refining steps, and we've heard this before. Supply chain is a huge issue. We don't have this industry anymore in Europe because it was, for our industry, we've had cheap energy. That was the driving um, force in Europe. We've had a, a vast amount of huge and cheap energy. And we were able to buy everything everywhere in the quantity of our choosing at the price that we, that we were dictating anywhere in the world, just in time. This is no longer happening. And we do not have these supply chains here. And it will take a long time to develop these supply chains again. And in order to do so, we need what? We need energy that is um, competitive in price. Fun fact, we don't have that anymore either. So this is really a huge problem. And when you look at refined products, like copper cathode or magnesium, the diagram is even um, more shifted into the upper right corner because China plays a huge role here. I don't know if you remember the, the crunch that we had on, on magnesium, um, where the government signed a letter to, to China pledging, could you please turn on the magnesium production again because you know uh, our stock is, is, is running low. So that tells you quite a lot. I brought you two, two examples from publications that we had, which are the uh, increase of renewable energies in Germany. And you can take it as a blueprint, if you will. You see circled down the, uh, on, on the right side that for wind energy, we wanted to increase by 82 gigawatt hours towards 2030. And that was before the war on Ukraine started. And that would imply more than 27 million tons of concrete I just told you how much CO2 there is uh, associated with that. Roughly 9 million tons of steel, a lot of other things, and roughly 6,000 tons of rare earth elements, heavy rare earth elements that we don't have. And that is only 82 gigawatts. So with the war going on and the, tr and the transition away from fossil fuels, this, this goal might even increase. So huge demand for those kind of materials on the wind sector. When you look at PV, same thing, R you know, steel, concrete, glass. Glass is very, very energy intensive. Um, plastics made from what? NAFTA products, oil based, aluminum, copper. But moreover, gallium, germanium, indium, selenium, materials that are small markets compared to the copper or aluminum market. And we need about 12 tons of gallium. All materials that we don't have in Europe. And that is 160 gigawatts um, of increase towards 2030. And I, I would assume that with all the things going on, that they will increase that figure even further. So huge demand for these kind of materials. Green hydrogen. I'm, I'm a fan of hydrogen. 
but I'm not a big fan of selling green hydrogen as the holy grail for everything because it does have certain applications where, it's, where it makes a lot of sense to use it and there's application where it doesn't make any sense at all. Like in cars, it doesn't make any sense because when you look at the energy efficiency, it is, it's beyond bad, okay? And the way that hydrogen is produced right now, it's beyond mediocre in terms of CO2 emissions, etc. Because usually right now, hydrogen is made from what? Gas. So, it just doesn't have a C in it, so that what makes it sexy on paper. When you talk about green hydrogen, um, you use the, as I said before, the electrolysis of water. I just touched upon the fact that you need very pure water from desalination of seawater. There's a lot of biological issues associated with that. If you want to uh, find out what it looks like, just go to Israel and you can see it in the Red Sea. Um, and this is from a publication that we did with uh, different um, demand scenarios based on the global SSPs, <clears throat> which are the socioeconomic, shared socioeconomic pathways, which will tell you where the global community will head to more to a, a sustainable way. This is column one, or like, um, like a middle way, and if we would stick on the fossil fuel way. So if we go on the sustainability side uh, of things and we would um, put into place a lot of green hydrogen, that would mean, and I've highlighted those, that we would need from nil demand for iridium in this technology to 34 tons. The problem with that is that iridium is a byproduct of the platinum and palladium production, mostly South Africa, Russia, and North America. And the current global market for iridium is roughly, is between seven and eight tons right now as a byproduct. So if you were to increase that from eight to 16 tons, that would mean you would dramatically have to increase the production for platinum and palladium. Otherwise you wouldn't get the iridium. The thing is there is no, the demand for platinum, <coughs> excuse me, and palladium is not, not there. It's not growing to that extent because we want to phase out conventional cars where you use a lot of platinum palladium for catalytic converters. So on the one side, you have a market that is destined to go down apart from the chemical industry for catalytic converters. And on the other hand, you need platinum group metals for this green hydrogen transition. But nobody will run a PGM mine purely on iridium alone because the basket price is made out of platinum, palladium, rhodium, and iridium. And the iridium price is not where it should be just to have that mine or to have that mine run economically on iridium alone. So there's different demand scenarios ranging from 34 up to close to 50 tons of iridium. Now one would can, can, could argue and say, well, um, this technology is just starting. Um, we have uh, um, iridium loads of 1 to 1.5 grams per kilowatt hour. That will go down because technological advance. Yes. Just imagine, well, those calculations are done with 1 gram iridium per kilowatt hour. Just imagine we go down to 0.5, which is a reduction of 50%, which is huge. That would still leave us with more than double or triple of what the global market can supply on the iridium side. And there's no supply from secondary iridium sources because the quantity in the, in the PEM cell is so little that recycling is simply not there yet. And we don't have enough in the market to supply that out of recycling. So this will be the limiting factor for the uptake of green hydrogen based on this technology. And then you could come again and argue, well, then we've got to have to implement other technologies. Yes, but that will take time. But the industry is already demanding a lot of hydrogen, green hydrogen, in the steel industry and in the chemical industry. But there's other implications because hydrogen, to my knowledge, does not have a lot of C in it. So there is industries like the steel industry that need the C in the coking coal and um, in their process because otherwise you lose a lot of other byproducts that are vital to other industries like gypsum and other things like flue gas and things that you can make out of flue gas. And you don't have that with hydrogen anymore. So replacing one product with another product will have implications on other industries. EVs. Um, 
On the motor side, um, you've got copper and aluminum. That's, that's not that big of an issue, but you've got magnets and rare earth elements. That is an issue. And of course, there are motors now in place that use less and even some that don't use them at all. But in general, in the mass market, there is a huge demand for those materials. On the body in white, you've got, they get more and more complex. We're going away from pure steel body um, to aluminum, magnesium, alloys, plastics, composites, carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is a nightmare on, uh, in energy consumption, in production, a pure nightmare. And it's even more a nightmare on the recycling side. There is no recycling solutions for carbon fiber. What do they do? They crush it and put it in waste dumps or, or burn it. Um, but there's not much else that you can do with it. And the problem with that is that you have not only a body in white that is made out of 100% steel, that's easy to recycle. But now you have bodies that are welded, glued, um, whatnot, with carbon fiber, plastics, you've got aluminum, steel, and other things combined. You cannot take a car like that and put it into a furnace. The furnace will just blow up. Or your charge, excuse me, if you have like steel and you have um, a little quantity of aluminum in that, that batch is lost. So how do you want to deal with that? You need a design for recycling and this is not in place right now. On the electronic side, I think we all know the, the supply crunch with chips and the funny stories or not so funny stories associated with that. You've got gold, silver, germanium, indium, silicon. Um, Taiwan, 79% of the chips come from TSMC. And the, and the battery. The battery is the part in the car with the highest amount of materials that you need. And you've got lithium, cobalt, nickel, magnesium, you know them all. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about lithium. Everybody knows the current supply scheme pretty much. You've got hard rock and brine based. You have uh, roughly 60% is hard rock based, mostly out of Australia. They'll go to spodumene and China conversion route and then find its way into either cells directly or into aftermarkets where it's uh, put into cells. And yes, we might have some potential in geothermal brines in Europe and in North America, but it's not put to, uh, let's say, um, commercial scale yet, and that's just a couple years down the road. So, But what's very important and what I want you to take away here is that different sources of these materials or of lithium will yield the same product through different product routes and with different associated environmental footprints. So you can have one ton of lithium carbonate sitting here. One has a CO2 footprint of five tons, the other one of 15 tons. And the same is true for cobalt, nickel sulfate, spherical graphite. So by choosing your raw materials and sourcing of your raw materials, you can modify and tweak your CO2 footprint of your, at the end of the day, of the whole car. So sustainability, and there is a lot of, a lot of have wisdom floating around, um, NGOs claiming and writing papers, but have never been to places that they're claiming to know. So there's a lot of false information floating around um, in the media. What I want you to take away is that water footprint, greenhouse gas emissions, and total CO2 emissions vary by source. And the brine deposits right now in Latin America contrary to what you read through NGOs and other papers, are on the sustainability side, the, best, the better product than the hard rock source size. Because hard rocks, spodumene ores, you need to crush and you need to heat them from, to get from alpha to beta spodumene, otherwise you can't treat it. That's why they do it in China, because you've got cheap energy there. So this is going to be a huge challenge for the industry to get that down in energy consumption because at the end of the day, this whole technology thing is to make things better, not to make them worse, okay? On the demand side, um, those six minutes are right, right? Yeah. Um, on the demand side, nobody knows. Nobody knows because this market is so dynamic and it changes from month to month. You have, what we know is for fact is that the demand will be driven by lithium ion batteries. I said before, regardless of the cathode of the current technology, they all need lithium between six and 11%. E-mobility will be the major driver, but energy storage will kick in 
in the near term future because we want to get away from fossil fuels and solar and wind you need to store for base load during night. What do you do? You take batteries. Lithium ion batteries are not your first choice, but they work. So this is going to be another demand driver. Of course, customer acceptance and infrastructure are important factors too, but contrary to regular commodity cycles, this demand is not customer driven, this demand is regulatory driven. And that is a huge difference because in a couple of years, we won't even have the choice to say, I want a conventional car because you will only be allowed to buy an EV and register an EV. And as I said, you can't replace lithium. We're stuck with lithium ion batteries and it's regulatory driven. So the demand cannot go away. These are two scenarios that we calculated and there's probably 20 scenarios out there with um, 50 opinions. You can pick and choose your own. This is the one that we did. Um, the blue colors show you the um, potential supply in a low and a high case scenario and the green columns show you all our projected demand. The 3 million ton LCE demand is only, and I say only, 4.5 terawatt hours. I know from a friend of mine from Simon Moose, um, they have cell capacities on their sh sheets now, six, seven, eight, nine terawatt hours. So you can double that already. So the supply side will not be able to fulfill this in 2030. There's no way. Katarina said it uh, on her panel, and I just saw it again on LinkedIn. We need more than 70 new lithium projects, the likes of Pilbara Minerals, battery grade in place in full swing by 2030. That's an investment of 80 to 100 billion dollars in the next eight years. Where does that money come from? It's not coming from Europe. This one is very telling because many people always ask, well, is the hype over? Because we've had a price crush in, I believe, 2017, 2018, and since then, Prices are at record levels, um, quite contrary to what Goldman Sachs was predicting. Um, but that one tells you in the green bar, over the last 60 years, we've produced globally 5.3 million tons of LCE in total, in 60 years. The demand that we have in the next nine years is nine to 13 million tons of LCE. That shows you the uptake in demand. And this is only to 2030. The hockey stick will go even steeper towards 2040, okay? This one looks complicated, but it isn't because you can break it down to two numbers because there's a common misconception. People say, well, there won't be a supply crunch because recycling will take care of it all. That's a funny statement because you can only recycle what you put into the market before. And the cars that we're going to recycle in 2030 are the cars that we've put on the road between 2018 and 2022. So what we put on the road today is our recycling base for 2030. So it, can, so it cannot fulfill or fill the supply gap. And you have a lot of key assumptions based on what the EU has in mind. And in 2030, the demand that I've shown you between three and 9% could come from recycling if if this is of battery grade quality, which is a whole different issue. Um, because if you need to take two or three more refining steps to get it from recycling back to battery grade quality in terms of particle size and impurities, um, you might end up with a higher footprint environmentally than primary sourced. But I know that there's a lot of recycling companies that are on this topic and I think that they can solve this. But the quantity to fulfill the supply gap will not come from secondary sources. If you would have told me six years ago that Europe is going to become an EV hotspot, I would have called myself a doctor or you would have called it whoever came first. But fact of the matter is that we've had 1.5 terawatt hours of announced capacity of cell manufacturing in Europe. Nobody knows where the material for that demand is supposed to come from. Supply in 2020 was around 90,000 tons. 
projected demand in Europe alone is going to be between 72 and 100,000 tons, depending on the um, utilization rate um, of these facilities. But our companies, they don't, they don't seem to see this. They just claim procurement has it under control, but they don't. But what about the others? What about cobalt, nickel, and graphite? I'm going to be done in a minute. Um, cobalt market, 142,000 tons, 1% out of Europe. In refined production, 140,000 tons, 14% out of Europe from imported materials. Nickel, a 2.4 million ton market, 3% out of Europe. Refined, 9% out of Europe. Graphite, 1.7 million tons, 1% out of Europe, 5% refined. If you want to cry, go to China, look at the spherical graphite plant, come back and keep crying, because you don't want to see this here. That's why it's in China. We don't have lithium mine production and conversion capacity in Europe today, not tomorrow, maybe towards 2030. And even then, we could be self-sufficient in Europe to, if all goes well and to plan and on agenda, 20 to 25 percent, maybe. And there's no uh, manganese or very minor manganese production. So we do have a high import dependency for these raw materials and re uh, refined intermediate products. Limited mining and refining production in Europe with energy questions on the horizon or looming. But we do have a developing downstream industry and they need to figure out where they get their raw materials from to do that refining here. So we need a lot more do and a lot less talk. Thank you very much. Just quickly, um, is Europe going to compromise on its um, sustainability credentials and no. standards in order to get the raw materials in? <laughs> Are we going to say, forget scope three, we're going to get everything we need to build these electric vehicles? No. Okay. No, that's a set target. and. I think we do need to question these things that we are demanding from other countries. I think we need to take off our arrogant view, our arrogant European view onto these countries. Um, we need to, the Chinese have a very huge uh, advantage over everybody else. They go into a country and they immediate, immediate, Im immediately see the needs of these countries and they fulfill those needs. And then everything comes afterwards. We as Europeans, we have a lot of high standards and hopes and, you know, we go there and tell them what to do. That's not the right approach. We should need to go there and listen to their needs and then work together with them to fulfill those needs while implementing our goals that we have. And that is the difference that we have. Um, I just came back from, from Namibia and Mozambique. And if you want to see how the Chinese work, just go there and have a good look. So, no, I don't think that we're going to compromise on that. We can't. Because all the stuff that we need for an energy transition, we wanted things, we, we want to make things better, not worse. Absolutely, excellent. But thank you very much.